Uh, all right. So the Strange Journey video is finally out. I got finals next week, and afterwards, this is gonna be Christmas break. Yeah, man, this shit's gonna be easy. Let's go. Three weeks later. Uh, after surviving the hell that was college finals, somehow we are still here in the good old New Year. Though we're also a week into it, we're about to be halfway into January. God damn it. Now, for our first video of the year, I ended up asking you guys all the way back in December what game you wanted me to review next because, yeah, after that Strange Journey video, I did not want to go immediately into SMT4. <laughs> so, uh, the choices was between Snowboard Kids and Mocking X, with you guys actually choosing the latter. Now, you're probably going to ask yourself, hey, what the fuck happened to Mocking X? And, um... A lot of things happen. Long story short, I ended up getting most of the sickness from it and it put me on my ass for a week straight. Yeah, and after writing the script for it, recording it, and just as I was about to sequence the video, I was not proud of what I had. Uh, the first clip you saw earlier was literally from that video and I was not happy with it and I decided, you know what, fuck it. We'll, we're just gonna go back to this in a later date because I just don't feel proud of it. Now, just because I am not reviewing my expert this month does not mean I'm not gonna, you know, void you guys of content. Because instead, I ended up coming up with a uh, surprise backup plan. I didn't really have one in general, but luckily I went through some of my computer files, you know, found my trauma center review that I was gonna be doing for October, and well, now we're here. Tells you guys you're gonna be seeing this shit soon. While I was recording for the Curious and Introduces video, I got to Trauma Center New Blood, which up until then I've never played. But that playthrough made me want to go more in depth with the series beyond just talking about the little things. So with that being said, here we are reviewing all of the Trauma Center games. Kind of. Okay, before we start, there is a couple things we do need to um establish real quick. First, these reviews are going to be split into two parts, so I don't drive myself to the point of insanity just like my Strange Journey video. And for this video, I'm going to be talking about Under the Knife, Second Opinion, and New Blood. The next part is going to feature Under the Knife 2 and Trauma Team, with those two being more on the longer side. Second, I will be including timestamps for each game so you can go to whichever one you might be more interested in, because I know for sure that someone might be intrigued with one over the other. So, with that out the way, let's start from the beginning. Trauma Center Under the Knife released on the Nintendo DS on October 4th, 2005 here in the US. The game has you playing as a new doctor named Derek Stiles, who after encountering a deadly disease known as Gil, is scattered by a medical group called Caduceus to find a possible cure against it. Now, this was one of the few games at the time that was being developed by some of the same people that was behind the Mega Ten games that we all know and love, as well as some other Atlas titles like Machin X. Oh, oh god damn it. Some of the notable people behind this project were Katsura Hashino, Shogo Isagai, Shoji Bagero, and Kenichi Sushiya, who all had some hand in different Atlas titles at this point. Now, it was also directed, and sorry for my pronunciation of this name, uh, Kazuya Nino, Nino? I think that's how you pronounce his last name? Eh? The game was inspired by Kasuya Hashino wanting to replicate certain simulators that were released on Windows. Though funny enough, a year prior to the release of Under the Knife, Spike beat Atlas of the Punch with Kintsui Tendo Dokuda, which I don't know much about the game, but from looking at the footage, it's very similar to Trauma Team, and I also didn't think that this might just be the weirdest game I've found yet. Uh, no, 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 not right now. We'll get to your ass later on. Now, the concept of Under the Knife was brought up several years prior, and it wasn't until the spring of 2004 where the team settled on the Nintendo DS as it was the best fit for what they wanted to do and began planning the summer of that year. Plus, with most of the people behind this game having mainly worked on Mega Ten games, uh, you can imagine that development wasn't exactly easy. But nonetheless, they persevered and the game released a positive reviews with it focusing on how innovative and different the game was compared to everything else released. And while not selling well in Japan, 
it sold well enough internationally that Atlas managed to make a profit. And make a profit they did, because they ended up printing the fuck out of this bad boy, which is why the franchise compared to Mega Ten is actually cheap to collect for. Most of the games never go beyond $30, with the exception of Under the Knife 2. Hmm. Fuck. Well, let's go ahead and get it started, and let's go check out Under the Knife's story, which fun fact came out 17 years ago. Yeah, haha, <laughs> fuck, I am getting old, Jesus Christ. <laughs> The game begins with us being introduced to Derek Styles, a doctor who recently completed his residency and my god is he an absolute dork. And this is shown all throughout the first chapter with everything being pretty slow for the most part. We see Derek gaining the experience with doing different surgeries, we see more of his personality, and we're later introduced to Angie Thompson, a new nurse at Hope Hospital and someone who will later be Derek's assistant throughout the entire series. Also. Angie is kind of a dick early on, yeah, specifically she is an absolute dick to Derek, and it gets worse when he ends up neglecting one of his patients after surgery despite the patient's condition being widely unknown. It gets to the point where Angie scolds him so hard that he almost quits being a doctor. That is, until a serious accident happens and Derek rushes back to the hospital to save the victim involved in it, during which the patient who was on the brink of death causes Derek to unconsciously activate the healing touch, an ability that allows doctors to concentrate so hard that they can wrap up a surgery fast, quick, and a jippy. That was a weird... Uh, anyway. A couple days after the surgery, Derek meets with the director of Hope Hospital, Robert Hoffman, where he attempts to convince Derek to stop using the healing touch. And you know what? I might be taking this the wrong way, but the way that this man went about it is so fucked up. To stop a bit, this man ends up telling Derek to stop using it, not for the fact that it'll cause him physical strain, but because it'll end up burdening him. And more specifically, this is all because of one incident that caused Hoffman to stop operating and this fucked with him so hard that he is stuck in the past with it. Yeah, while it's understandable to an extent, it could have been written a whole lot better. Because in here, he's just putting the darkest thought in Derek's mind and it's just, I don't know man, that's some evil shit right there. During one operation, Derek and Angie comes across a mysterious organism that's causing mayhem in the patient's body, and after getting rid of it, Derek learns from his mentor, Greg Castle, that it's a man-made disease named guilt. Now this disease has been slowly popping up around the world, causing countries to band together and finding a way to deal with it. And Derek's performance against guilt and the power of the healing test leads to him and Angie being scouted by Caduceus. And while Hoffman attempts to persuade him in the most fucked up way imaginable to not join, Derek joins anyway, and from here nothing really major happens besides a couple things. We see Derek facing off against different strands of guilt, with each one getting more and more dangerous. At one point he ends up having to defuse a fucking bomb with the help of a former officer turned doctor, Siebel Myers, I think that's how you pronounce her first name, I'm not sure, and going to Africa and learning about Delphi, the group responsible for creating guilt. Eventually Derek heads back to Caduceus after learning that his mentor Greg Castle was infected with a new strain of guilt, and later operates on the director of Caduceus as he too was affected with a new strain. The surgery that spans across three different operations leads the director on his deathbed, and before passing away, he requested for Hoffman to become the new director, which he decides to take up after a little bit of convincing. After dealing with an outbreak of guilt, Caduceus ends up getting raided by members of Delphi, with one of the members being Angie's father, Kenneth Blackwell, who has been researching guilt to the point of even abandoning his family. This leads to Derek and Angie joining in on a raid to go after her father, who we later found out was affected with a strain of guilt known as Savato but Derek and Angie somehow managed to cure him despite how aggressive the strain was. After recovering, Blackwell decides to give his full cooperation towards the destruction of Gil and points Derek and the others to a vessel in the Atlantic Ocean where a bunch of kids are there incubating guilt. Oh. Derek manages to cure them all and we come face to face with Adam, the leader of Delphi and is the host of all, and I mean all, of the strains of Gil, including a unique one named Bliss that knocks Derek the fuck out. And after waking up, we find out that Caduceus Europe has taken down the vessel and took Adam's body away with Derek being celebrated as a medical hero. And um, yeah, that's it for the story. Um, very short. Under the Knife doesn't really have that deep of a story compared to the other games I've reviewed on this channel, that for what we get is actually pretty good. The stakes with guilt helps keep you interested and wondering just how worse it can get, but something that really should have been fixed was the dialogue, and some of it is awkward as all hell. 
while others point out make characters seem like absolute dicks. Now, I don't know why it was written like this, I don't know if this was a localization issue, but a lot of the characters come off as pretty mean-spirited to Derek, to the point of making him a sort of punching bag. Now, this is prevalent in the first two chapters, and as for the other chapters, some bits of it are, you know, tough love, while others really aren't. But something that actually caught my eye more than the story was the character art. Now, for the one and seemingly only time for this franchise, the character art was done by my girl Ikehara, someone who I guess dropped from the face of the earth because I can't find anything on this person at all. All we know is that they worked on this game and might have worked on some of the art for Devil Survivor, but I still gotta check on that. Beyond that though, the art is the epitome of early 2000s anime. Everything from the size of the bodies, the expression, and honestly everything else. In some ways I kind of miss this art style a bit as it gives the game its own unique style. Though it also aces the game like hell, including the graphics, which makes it look like it was supposed to be a Game Boy Advance game. But uh, yeah, overall I think the story is fine. There isn't really much to say besides needing better dialogue. But now let's jump into that gameplay. Uh, which isn't really a lot as well, but oh god it's janky as fuck. Okay, so the flow of this game is pretty simple. For about one third of each episode, you get some story dumps that lead into surgeries. First, you'll get a briefing on what the surgery is going to be and the objective of it, which is always to treat whatever the issue is. And afterwards, we gotta deal with the surgeries himself, which vary from simple stuff like taking glass out of somebody's arm to dealing with the eldritch beings that are guilt. Now, you have different surgical tools for saving your patient that are actually explained well throughout the first chapter. Normally, I hate tutorials because of how obtrusive it can be, but they actually do a pretty decent job here, making it hands-on instead of reading a wall of text on what to do. Now, the first chapter of the game is pretty chill, with the surgery being not too bad, annoying, but really not bad. But starting with the end of chapter 2 and damn near the rest of the game, you're going to have to deal with guilt, which can be really, really annoying. And overall, there's seven strengths that all require different ways of taking them out. Kiriaki is the first and thankfully the easiest strand to deal with, as all you gotta do is locate them, cut them, and hit the bitch with your laser. The second strand is Devterra, and this is also where the game starts to pick up in difficulty a little bit. You gotta drain them when they form a circle, and after doing it enough times, they'll be violent as fuck, and you gotta cut it out before it kills the patient. On paper, it doesn't sound too bad, but in practice, it's annoying as hell when you gotta deal with two of them bitches. Next is the hell spot known as Trite, or Trinity, Triote, I don't know. Now this strain is a puzzle in and out of itself. How so? Well, they come in a row and you gotta pluck these metal rods to take the membrane out. But the problem is that the metal rods come back really quickly. If you take one out while it's adjacent to another rod, it will respawn. And this shit sucks so much. Tatari is the fourth one and it's surprisingly easy. Now all you gotta do is inject the right color at the thing and boom, you are done. Now I hope you have a good memory because if you mix the two up, it will produce a tumor which you need to get rid of unless you want the patient to die. Kinda seeing the little, kinda seeing the pattern here. Pimpty is the fifth one and also easy as you're using the laser to burn the shit out of it. There's also another level of annoying shit with it because the stuff that it will spawn is so annoying as it can lead different tumors or lacerations that you gotta deal with. Luckily it's not too bad and I guarantee you can handle it. Pervisky is the sixth one and this one fucking sucks because of the amount of micromanaging you're gonna be doing as you gotta keep on freaking freezing them, cutting them, freezing them, cutting them, then you gotta use the forceps to take them out. And here's the thing, if you let it get near to the heart, the patient is dead. Yeah. Finally, it's Salvato, which is the literal spawn of Satan and makes me want to tear my hair out. Though, funny enough, it's also a fun final boss, which is kind of ironic, uh, but still. All of these strains will make your life a living hell, and I want you to keep this in mind that you have three ways, yes, three ways to get a game over that will likely happen. You have a time limit that is usually around five minutes, and sometimes it'll be ten minutes if you have multiple people to operate on. If you run out of time, which can happen, you'll get a game over. You also have the patient's vitals, which if it goes to zero, boom, game over. Oh, and what's worse about this is that their vitals can rapidly go to zero, especially if you have tumors and different last races to deal with. So not only do you gotta deal with whatever the surgery requires in the allotted time, but you also gotta worry about the little injuries, as it will drop the vitals to zero, which again, will happen. Lastly, it's the miss limit, which is thankfully only in this game, but if you're new and don't know what you're doing, 
you'll end up like how I did one time and get a game over because of it. So yeah, this game isn't exactly fun and it's all because of how janky it is, which is kind of expected of a DS game. The level of jank for this game isn't on the level of NES games, but it sort of has that Game Boy jank, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, then what I mean is that a lot of the jank comes from the hardware, especially if you need to do specific things. This can end up affecting some of the searchable tools you have to use, and it's worse on emulation if you have to drain something or use a syringe. If anything, and I mean anything, is slightly off screen, like a freaking pixel off screen, you won't be able to use the drain or syringe, and I had this happen when training aneurysms, which were annoying beyond belief. Another example is the magnification tool, which fucking sucks. It requires you to draw a quick circle, but even if you do that, it may not even register at all. In normal circumstances, it's not bad. You might run low on time, but it is what it is. But when shit gets tense, and trust me, it will, this becomes a major issue. And don't get me started with dealing with this jank when it comes to guilt, because, oh god. And because of all of that shit, yeah, I couldn't even finish this game at all. I shit you not, I was on the verge of getting carpet tunnel because of how quick I had to do things with just a measly mouse. If I remember correctly, I think on hardware it wasn't as bad, annoying, but again, not as bad. But when I had to deal with this shit on emulation, oh my god, and it all got worse on the fifth chapter where you gotta deal with five patients with Kiriaka. And what's worse is that these versions and the other versions of guilt in this chapter is way more aggressive, making it hard to actually be. Once I got to my first encounter with Prezif Key, Prezif Key, I don't fucking care. I was done and I dropped this shit quicker than I dropped Stone Ocean. I love this game, I really do, but I can't in good conscience recommend y'all a game that will drive you to the point of insanity. But luckily, there is a way to play this game and not hate yourself. Released a year after the release of the first Under the Knife, Second Opinion is a remake that drastically overhauls the gameplay. It makes a very janky game to something that is actually pretty solid, mostly. And man, the changes that were done was, whew, and they were pretty crazy. Now let's get the obvious out the way being the character design, which was done by Masayuki Doi. Now if you have played any of the recent Mega Ten games starting with SMT4, then you might be familiar with his work. While people have varying opinions on it, I'll just say right now that I love his work. Sure, it's not conical levels, but man, the designs are pretty solid. Mainly their human designs though, yeah, we'll get to those demon designs later. In the context of Trauma Center, they are a lot more down to earth and actually look their age. Derek actually looks 26 instead of looking like he's in his 30s, and Angie doesn't look like he just turned 20. But I can't say that for Hoffman and Clark. With Hoffman going from your standard old man who looks like he's pretty chill to hang with to an ancient motherfucker that will cast fireball in your ass, and Clark went from looking like a dilf to a regular middle aged man that's built like a gnome. Like I mentioned before, the game itself was a full on remake of the first game, but this time taking advantage of the Wii controls. Though, just like the first game, uh, they had a hard time with development. Now before we get into that though, there were some changes that were going on, with Daisuke Kanata now acting as the new director for the series, and this will also be the last Trauma Center game that Kazura Hashino and Soji Magero would work on before going to work on Persona. Now as for the development in general, the team was struggling at the time as not only was this being developed on new hardware, but also within a short time frame. They even asked for assistance from Atlas USA with creative ideas, especially because they wanted to differentiate the remake to the original. And as such, we got ourselves a classic Atlas re-release or remake or whatever the hell you want to call this situation. And for those who don't know much about Atlas inner workings or whatever the hell I'm talking about, well, whenever a game does really well, it'll get another version of it with improved gameplay and a whole new story. Though oftentimes, uh, people will be mixed on it, just like with Strange Journey Redux. Yep. In this case though, we do have Nozomi Weaver in a whole new 6th chapter, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And similar to the first game, Second Opinion ended up getting positive reviews and actually sold over 400,000 copies, both in the US and the UK. Though. Uh, Japan still got the bad end of the stick with sales. And really, I don't really have a lot to say about the story. And I mean, if we're going to talk about gameplay when we get to there, there is a shit ton. But um, 
You know what? Actually, scratch that. Let's actually talk about the story real quick and also some of its new changes. Second Opinion Story, like I said before, has been greatly improved. This is due to Atlas USA kind of tightening the dialogue during their localization for this game. And as such, a lot of the dialogue has been improved and a lot of the characters aren't really dicks anymore. And Derek really isn't the butt of all of this dickery and shit. The fuck dickery? What the fuck? Now, the conversation with Hoffman translates more towards a mentor being worried about his pupil than being a dick about it. Though Angie's still kind of rude, it's not as bad as before. But the big change does come with not just a new character, but a whole new chapter that replaces the sixth chapter of the original. Allow me to introduce you guys to Naomi Kimishima, or as she goes by, Nozomi Weaver. She's a doctor from Japan that was ostracized for her healing touch ability, and since then has migrated to America where she now works for Delphi, the organization responsible for creating guilt. Now, while Naomi's story isn't really long, it's actually really short, it's actually pretty cool as it delves more to the motive of Delphi being to create a disruption of peace that was created after modern medicine advanced to the point of curing quote-unquote incurable diseases. Now, while I'm at it real quick, yeah, um, this game really shows that these motherfuckers are obsessed with death. Like, I didn't mention it earlier when talking about Under the Knife, but they made sure to solve their love for it here, Jesus Christ. But after Chapter 5, we see her dipping before Caduceus raids the facility she's in, and while she's at it, she gets a sample of guilt, which leads us to our new chapter. The new Chapter 6 takes place a couple months after the events of the first game and has Derek and Angie going to the UK to assist them with Z-cells, which are being used to help regenerate certain parts of her body. Now, Naomi ends up working with Caduceus Euro because of her info on guilt, though it quickly goes sideways from Derek getting infected with two strands of guilt, yeah, two strands of it, and... Holy shit! That shit right there. As Derek and Naomi are treating the people there, it's revealed that Dr. Owen was a researcher working with Delphi, and we find out that the dumbasses of Caduceus Europe were using Adam's body to create these cells. Talk about a dumbass idea. As such, Hoffman ends up getting affected with a mutated form of Salvato, and alongside Naomi, Derek and Angie manage to cure Hoffman. And from that point, the game kind of just ends with characters saying their final goodbyes. There isn't really a final just yay. <laughs> So the new story overall is actually pretty decent. We end up learning more about Delphi, which is actually pretty cool, and also having Naomi, one of the most badass characters in Trauma Center, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, is pretty dope. Plus, the story was actually greatly improved, so moments now have a little more impact to them. But one highlight I want to bring is the charm of this game, which was kind of lost with the new art style. While I sort of miss the original, sort of, I like the new art style, and it actually wears its inspiration on its sleeve. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, and I know I gotta get better at it. This game was also inspired by Western medical dramas that we have, like Chicago Hope and Grey's Anatomy. Um, not sure about the last part, I think? Uh, anyway, while we want to see the full inspiration until the next game, it's still here, just with that uh, Atlas flair to it. Now, while the story didn't really change much besides the new content, we did end up getting a complete overhaul in the gameplay department and the music department. Holy shit, this OST is... So good, fuck. Before we talk about gameplay, let's talk music, because this game, and really this whole entire franchise, has some good ass music. The music for Second Opinion was done by Soji Magero, Kinesi Susiya, Shingo Yasumoto, and Toshiki Konishi. A lot of the normal tracks were redone in higher quality and have a whole new bounce to it, but the new track vulnerability created by Magero is literal crack to my ears. This track has to be the best final boss music I've heard from this man, and really, this song can ideally be used in other final boss fights as well. That's just how good this song is. On the topic of gameplay, it does a complete 180 by making the flow of the game faster and virtually removing all of the jank from the original. Kind of. There is still some jank here and there, but it doesn't really do much negatively towards the gameplay. You use the Wii Remote to do different actions, which can get a little uncomfortable depending on which actions you have to do. And with the nunchucks, you can choose the tools you need, which can also open up the chance for playing co-op with friends, though I can also imagine there'll be nothing but yelling under stressful situations. Now, something I forgot to mention, again, Jesus Christ, and under the knife was the healing touch, which here in Second Opinion, by pressing the Z and A button and drawing a star, things will slow down allowing you to do certain tasks much easier, but that's all it does. While it does make things a lot easier, you can only use it once per operation, which is crucial for the later parts of the game. 
Now, at the end of every operation, you get a score which in the first game wasn't completely clear, but in second opinion, they specify different scores for how fast you do it, the vitality of the patient, and other challenges such as not using the healing touch for the operation. As for my experience on the game, it is so much easier than the original, especially because they let you choose your difficulty being easy, normal, and hard. In the original, it kind of had these, like, difficulty spikes that come out of nowhere and it was very inconsistent but here you can adjust the difficulty at any time especially if you feel like the game gets a little too easy or a little too hard which i actually really enjoyed now i mainly played on easy just to get through recording easily but it was still difficult in some parts which i actually liked now when trying on normal and hard mode they represent the original game's difficulty but not as annoying the best way to describe it overall though is that the harder the difficulty, the more the vitals drop and the more careful you have to be, which at this point is kind of obvious. Another thing I didn't mention was the XS mission, which I did not do because there are challenging versions of guilt and after beating it, which good luck if you attempt to do this, you'll get extreme mode, which, uh, yeah, it's hell to say the least. The Jank I mentioned earlier is in this game as well, which is not surprising though considering it's on the Wii. Sometimes certain actions will register which will lead to you spending some time trying to troubleshoot the dang. And this is especially the case with the healing test as you have to be really quick with it and precise or it won't register which is really annoying. The Jake doesn't completely kill the game but those bits will more likely be held to deal with. Overall this game is the better pick in my opinion if you want to get into the series as this game is beginner friendly with options to challenge yourself with the harder difficulties. And while the story is pretty solid, it might just be one up by the next game which was also released a year after the release of this game. Trauma Center New Blood released on the Wii on November 20th, 2007. Instead of focusing on Derek or Angie for this adventure, this time we're focusing on two new doctors as they have to deal with a new disease called Stigma. And New Blood is actually a pretty good title for this game as there are a bunch of new characters with the old cast not really being mentioned as much besides Derek and Angie. Everything else is also new, new settings, new faces, and of course, the new dangers. On the development side of things though, there weren't much with most of the people from Second Opinion coming back to work on this game besides Kazuhiro Hashino and Soji Magero, who we can only assume was working on other stuff around the development of this game, i.e. Persona, but mm. Not only that, but the major thing that this team wanted to do was to take everything from Second Opinion and further improve on it. And this shows, because this game is so far one of the better Trauma Center games. And to jump ahead a bit, everything about it is so much smoother. The game isn't as strict when it comes to doing certain actions, the sensitivity is better than in Second Opinion, and the surgeries themselves aren't too long. But it's all for this game's difficulty. And it's goddamn difficulty. Alright, so let's go ahead and get on to that story, which actually does a lot more than the past Trauma Center games so far. Set 10 years after the events of Second Opinion, where the once deadly disease guilt has now been eradicated, the game begins with us in Alaska being introduced to our two new protagonists, Marcus Vaughn, a senior doctor who is pretty laid back, and Valerie Blaylock, a fairly new doctor who works under Vaughn as a pseudo-apprentice. That last one's really weird by the way. During the first chapter of the game, everything is pretty chill. We get slight info about Marcus and Valerie as well as the setup for the main conflict in the story. We also meet our new nurse, Elena Salazar, and learn that not only does Marcus have the healing touch, but Valerie does as well after unlocking it during a stressful surgery. After Director Hoover decides to close down the hospital that Marcus and Valerie were working at, they are sent back to LA to work at Concordia Medical Institute where they are summoned by Professor Wilkins who seems to have some sort of connection to Marcus. Upon their return, they learn that Wilkins has contracted a virus that seems to have no cure. He dubs it Stigma and requests for Marcus and Valerie to use the healing test to cure him. However, right after doing this, a mysterious group breaks into Concordia and kidnaps Professor Wilkins. Moments after the incident, Marcus and Valerie and Elena are all contacted by the head of Caduceus USA, Irene, to work with them due to not just this incident, but a rise in stigma cases across the country. And from here, the story kind of just gets put in the back seat for a bit. In general, the game's main focus is about the day-to-day -day life of being a doctor as well as the struggles of it, and most importantly, a commentary on good old healthcare, which doesn't really feel outdated, especially nowadays. Ooh. But the issue is the balance between this and stigma, which wasn't an issue before in past games. 
Whereas before, guilt was the main focal point of the story, a lot of the cases with stigma during the first half of the game are put towards the end of the chapter, where it introduces the new strain of it. It isn't until the second half where stigma starts to get more focused, not just in the story but in gameplay as well. The commentary about healthcare itself though is pretty cool but straightforward as all hell. There's one case that focuses on a kid desperately needing surgery to remove his appendix. But because the parents have zero healthcare due to how expensive it is, Valerie ends up finessing a trust fund kid to pay for the boy's surgery. And then there's the fourth chapter which focuses on this fucked up show called Miracle Surgery, which ideally sounds great, but another part of it feels very fucked up and something that could exist in the real world. Though, uh, imagine they would hopefully do proper ways to not contaminate shit, but anyway, this does however take us to the fifth chapter onward where stigma becomes a major issue. While trying to find a restaurant that their co-worker invited them to, the trio gets kidnapped by weird dudes in masks and are forced to perform surgeries on stigma victims. During their time in captivity, we learn that Professor Wilkins is working with them and supplying them with the stigma virus. And after treating another stigma patient, Marcus drops a bomb on us and tells us that he was responsible for the creation of stigma, but not intentionally. While working with Professor Wilkins on his research, Marcus made genetically modified mice with one of them being very different. While excising the tumor out of the mice, stigma came into contact with that and artificial blood becoming the virus we know of today. And prior to being kidnapped, we learned that the virus can only survive with a metal known as corillium, which is being used in most medical equipment. Add to the fact that the virus is being used by the group that kidnapped us called the Kidman Family for Biological Warfare, yeah, shit just went from 0 to 100 real fucking quick. After escaping, the trio heads to Kuluruma? 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 Okay, that's a weird ass name. But anyway, they end up going to the country that is a source of Corillium. However, the country is also dealing with a civil war, which eventually leads to Marcus and Val having to perform emergency surgeries and eventually deal with a stigma outbreak, which not only affected the soldiers, but also one of Kidman's cronies. Also, you may be curious what happened to Kidman himself? Well, he ended up getting got by soldiers during an attack. But what's worse is that we learned that Stigma is evolving past the point of needing Corillium, and after making it back to the US, Valerie's friend Cynthia has gone missing. And despite all the negative shit going down, there are some positives. We get some info about one of Kidman's hideouts thanks to his mother, and we end up having to save Professor Wilkin, who is being controlled by a medical implant in his brain. While not remembering everything regarding Stigma, we later learn from the investigation that the person responsible for the Stigma outbreak and the leader of the Kidman family was this Jesus Christ looking motherfucker Vakushti. Vakushti? We're calling him Vamp, just fuck it. We find his hideout and end up having to save Cynthia, who was initially helping him, but is now being controlled by him through a medical implant he put in her heart. Also, real quick, why the fuck is this man just constantly putting medical implants in people's bodies as if he's gonna, you know, boom somebody? Wait a minute. After saving Cynthia, we encounter Vamp who spills his backstory, an evil monologue about basically being a god. Before Marcus goes, fuck that shit, get ready for the operation. They end up coming across the last and most powerful strain of stigma and eventually defeating it. Before dying, Vamp reveals that he was using stigma to alter his brain condition as he was suffering from Russell Syndrome. We later take his research and the game ends with Marcus and Val continuing to fight against the last bit of stigma and find a cure for the virus. And yeah, that's Trauma Center New Blood for ya. Honestly, the story is actually really good, but it did feel a little unfocused on some parts, mainly the balance between wanting to tell a story about being doctors despite the fucked up nature of healthcare and shit, and the fight against the new virus being stigma. By themselves, they are cool, though the healthcare storyline could be improved a bit more, but together it makes the story more bloated, to the point where they could have done something different to introduce stigma. Maybe as the game progresses, you know, they slowly introduce stigma more and more until the climax is BOOM! Stigma is a problem and we gotta fix this shit. Another thing I was not a fan of was Marcus's story about him creating stigma, which was something I was quickly able to catch onto by the time the second chapter rolled through. The foreshadowing is clear that Marcus has a dark past, alongside his trait about being, you know, a lot more laid back, chill, yin yang type of shit. And by the time he drops the bomb on us, it doesn't really feel impactful despite there being a slight build up on it. Because the bombshell itself feels like you're telling someone some bad news weeks after it happened. Like telling your parents you were expelled weeks after it happened. Or telling your best friend that you scammed them out of a hundred of dollars weeks after it happened. I messed that up, I know, but you get the point, right? And all of this doesn't make it better with the character's reaction being like, Oh, really? Also, sorry if this feels like a random jump, but this game actually has voice acting, with this and Trauma Team being the only Trauma Center games with it. And for their first time, 
It isn't half bad. Marcus and Valerie are some of the standouts, with them fitting the character and all of their reactions perfectly. It's also surprising that some of the side characters had decent voices as well, like Derek, who was voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, Irene being voiced by Mary Elizabeth McLean, who I actually even found out recently voices a bunch of characters from Naruto Shippuden. She voices Makoto Kusanagi from Standalone Complex and Jenna Angel from the Digital Devil Saga games. But for every character that has great voice acting, there are some that are absolute dog shit. The nurses in particular are the worst offenders as they often sound like either robots or they just don't want to be there. And what's weird is that Elena Salazar is voiced by Karen Strassman, and this isn't even her first time as a voice actress, as prior to this game she voiced Soi Fon and Momo Hinomori from Bleach, Aikis from P3, and Nanako and Izanami from P4. It's wild because those characters I mentioned were great performances from her, so why does it sound so flat in this game? Also, don't get me started on Leslie Newman, whose voice is so hard to listen to, but is it as bad as House of the Dead 2's voice acting? The original sin that man is responsible to. To protect the life cycle. Eh, you can decide. Now, overall, the story isn't really bad, but it's definitely something that could have been better if there was more buildup and a more satisfying payoff for the mysteries. Plus, I won't blame the voice actors and the voice actresses too much on their performances, because, yeah, you know, sometimes it's the director's fault. But let's get on with that gameplay, <laughs> that fucking gameplay. I'm gonna fast forward this a bit and say that if you thought Second Opinion was difficult in any way, shape, or form, prepare to get fucked by New Blood, as this game is the hardest in the Trauma Center franchise. Before we get to that though, let's get to the basics real quick. Similar to the last game, you can use the Wii Remote to do different actions and use the nunchucks to choose which medical tool you'll use. Whenever you want to use the healing touch, you just gotta hold the Z and A button down and draw a star. Other than that, everything else is largely the same surgery wise, but there are a few new things run into the mix. First of all, you can control either Marcus or Valerie before each surgery, and something I didn't realize while playing was that each of them have slight differences in gameplay, specifically when it comes to the healing touch. If you play as Marcus and use his healing touch, he can slow down time similar to Derek in Second Opinion, whereas when Valerie uses the healing test, she'll stop the patient's vitals from going down, which is a major lightsaber for some cases. Now, despite playing as mainly Valerie for her benefits, Marcus was sometimes the better choice as the new operations we have to do require a lot of speed and precision. So much so that the sensitivity of the Wii Remote was changed with this in mind. Now get used to it because despite it being pretty decent, uh, at the end of the day you might develop carpal tunnel from this game. Some of the new operations in this game involves organ transplants and probably the scariest surgery of them all, brain surgery, which is extremely stressful in this game. Then you have stigma with there being 6 overall and they are way more annoying than guilt. Also, disclaimer, I'm not going to be able to pronounce all these names correctly, so please do not get on my case. Anyway, Cher is the first strain introduced and shows how aggressive this virus is. It's like karaoke, but it also adds tumors, which also needs to be hit with the laser and... Ah, shit. Soma is the second strain introduced, and no, it's not the glorious item from Megaton. It's more like the bane of your existence, and if you don't use the drain on it, prepare for that patient to die. Then there's Ops, which is probably the second most annoying strain to face, as when dealing with it, you gotta quickly switch between using the drain and using the laser, and as you keep weakening it, this strain turns into the world's most annoying game of Pong. Onyx is the fourth strain, and this strain could go fuck itself. This is the most annoying ass one to face because it does nothing but hide and the only way of finding it is the pattern on the top of his head. If it's a square, you tear and if it's a triangle, you don't break his ankles. Bad rhyme, I know, but trust me, this strain caused me so much pain and game overs. Next is Brachion and I don't think I... I actually don't know how to pronounce that. Anyway, the strain isn't too bad, it's actually the easiest one as you gotta inject the center of it with a serum which dies after 3 or 4 hits. Finally is Cardia, which imagine that it's a fusion between Tri-T and Savato, and they make that fusion easy as hell. Out of all the final bosses so far in this series, this is the easiest one as you don't necessarily need to use the healing touch at all. Maybe, but not really. But it also has maybe the third best final boss music in the series composed by Asuhi Kitajo and Toshiki Konishi, who fun fact, this was the first game Kitajo was a composer for. Beyond some of the pain that I had to endure with these strings, some of them were engaging to say the least. It requires the player to be quick and to an extent be precise about their actions. And I guarantee that for these guys, you're going to be using the healing touch like a motherfucker. Then there's the new surgeries I mentioned earlier, which are mixing difficulty as well. Despite there not being a lot of these surgeries, 
The times where you actually have to do them should easily highlight the difficulties of being a surgeon, and I am glad my 13 year old self decided to not be one, or I will be going to jail for malpractice. The transplants aren't bad as you just have to deal with the kidneys, but there is a moment where not only do you have to deal with that, but you also gotta deal with mutated forms of stigma, and some of the strains, oh boy, it makes this whole surgery stressful as hell. But nothing, but nothing at all beats the brain surgery. Jesus Christ, why is this a thing in this game? There are only two major brain surgeries to deal with, and they are all stressful as hell because one, and yes, one mistake can lead to an instant game over. And this happened a lot, mind you. Thankfully, again, there were only two of these because if there were more, nine times out of ten, I'm throwing my remote to the wall. Yo, yo, uh, welcome to a little editor's note real quick. Haven't done this one in a bit. Uh... Long story short, I kind of messed up a couple details in my new blood section of this video. Yeah, <laughs> oh god damn it. So, uh, what I happened was that while I was writing the new blood section for this video, I ended up writing it around 4, 5 o'clock in the morning, because my sleep schedule was fucked up. And I didn't even think to like check over some of the mistakes I've made when recording, and uh... Yeah, they all made it into the final project. I did not feel like re-recording all of that shit and chopping everything back up. So, I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the editor's note. But real quick, let's go and just clarify and fix some of the issues that I made. Just so, you know, some things are a little bit more clear. And on the gameplay side of things, if you guys do decide to play this game, um, you don't get fucked over by what I said. <laughs> so, uh, let's go. So, starting with the story, I mentioned that Vamp here was a part of the Kidman family, when in fact he is actually the leader of the crime syndicate called Paracus. Or P Parkourus? Wait, give me a second. This group based in Caucasus calls itself Parnassus. Yep, that's it right there. On the gameplay side of things, there are three things that I do want to mention. Two that I need to clarify a bit more, and one that I definitely need to uh, fix. So, like I mentioned with Valerie's healing touch, she can basically stop the vials from going down. But this is also a drawback as not only does it stop it from going down, but it can also stop it from going up. Meaning that if you wanted to use the green syringe to kind of bring the vials back up, it won't work while using the healing touch. The second thing is that new blood also has co-op, but instead of making your friends use just this nunchuck like in Second Opinion, they can also use the Wii Remote to control either Marcus or Valerie, which is great because a lot of these surgeries by yourself is really fucking difficult. And now that I think about it, I think they might have designed this game purely for co-op. Oh, shit. Now for the thing that I need to fix. So, uh, do you remember the strain Barakian? Barakian? I still don't know how to pronounce this, even weeks after saying it a couple times. But anyway, the method that I mentioned for this strain was wrong, as what you're supposed to do is inject the serum to these hairy balls over here, cut them, and take them out the body a couple times, and then boom, you're done. Now, I could make a castration joke here, but I am far beyond that. It kind of. Oh, and before I forget, uh, those little organ transplants that's in New Blood isn't actually new. It actually appeared in Second Opinion first with some of the missions that Naomi had to do. Now, granted, it was only one, but still kind of there. Yeah, yeah. And with that, there's all the clarification and all the fixes that I should have done before, but I didn't. <laughs> But uh, regardless, though, thank you guys for making it this far to the video. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest. Let's go. But beyond the new stuff added and the difficulty of this game, New Blood is easily the best in the series. Initially, I thought this game wasn't as good as Second Opinion, but when I went through the game again for this review, yeah, it definitely feels better than Second Opinion. I might have been annoyed with the sensitivity and the difficulty, but I can't lie and say that I at least enjoyed the game. Play a lot more. The team's main goal was improving the gameplay, and they did that shit, even if some parts of it were annoying. But hell, maybe when I get a chance, I might replay New Blood again and try to go for the XS missions. Oh Christ. With New Blood out of the way, uh, if I had to recommend any of these games, which one would I consider being the best one to play? Easily, I could say don't play Under the Knife unless it's on actual hardware, because emulation will definitely kill your wrist. As for Second Opinion and New Blood, yeah. Play these bad boys. Now, do you have to play Second Opinion to understand the story of New Blood? No, and that can be the case for all of these games, because they're all standalone in some way, shape, or form, and they only just call back to certain events. They're not important. Also, if you're thinking about buying copies of this game, thankfully they're still pretty cheap, but you might want to hurry before that changes because you know how the market is. Yeah. 
And with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. Again, I want to thank you guys for such a great 2022. Uh, thank you guys again for supporting my strange journey video. It really means a lot to me as I put a lot of work into it. And also, thank you guys for showing out for my Megaton videos. Yeah, I was surprised that a lot of them are now at 100 views right now, or at least 200. And, I mean, I, I like some of those videos, but I was damn sure this is just cool with some of the numbers that they had. Uh, I'm especially happy with the SFT2 video. That's kind of one of my favorites right now. And, uh, yeah, I think you also, guys, I think you also got me to 100 for Astral Chain 2, which I'm really happy about. By the way, play that game. Great game. <laughs> um, and, yeah, again, thank you guys so much. And I can't wait till 2023, uh, or, I mean, this year. Uh, you get the point, right? Damn it. We're just going to go crazy in this bit. So, hopefully, I don't have any more distractions or, of course, everything goes smoothly for the first half of this year. As we are going back into the Megaton retrospect fully this time. Uh, the next game that we are going to be reviewing is SMT4. With the major plan right now to get that out hopefully by early February and get four Apocalypse by early March and hopefully we can get five at the end of March as well. I, I don't think that's going to happen at all but we're going to see. Uh, and then afterwards we have our Majin Tensei retrospect. And we also got to deal with Ronde. I'm not looking forward to that either. Jesus fucking Christ. Maybe we do have to add those two final little special games in there. Maybe. But like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. And make sure to press that little bell icon so you guys know when videos are going to be coming out. And make sure to stay safe, wear a mask because it's getting crazy out there. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!